All right, so I just wanted to continue um, talking about soul winning. It's actually part two of last week's sermon. I think I've got a lot of things in here. So if it's, if it's a bit long for you and you need to get up and walk around or get a drink, uh, feel free to do that. If you do miss anything, you can always uh, hear the recording later of anything you didn't get. But I, wa- I really wanted to just talk uh, this week about some soul winning tips. Like I said last week, because you know we're a new church, Soul winning is our main focus. I wanted to preach on soul winning first just so that we are all on the same page in um, you know, what we're doing here and we're all of the same mind. I'm uh, not saying that you have to agree with everything I say totally, but um, I guess what my opinion is and what I think is best practice. But let's, let me just talk a bit first of all about you know, why I think uh, door knocking is the most effective and why I think it's the best method out of all the other alternatives out there. And kind of like how we have on our website, if you don't want to believe the Bible, sometimes uh, the best way to, uh, I guess, reason in your own mind why the Bible is the best and most rational thing to believe is uh, what what are the alternatives? I mean, if you're not going to believe the Bible, what would then you put in its place? And I really feel that's one way you can approach you know, why we knock doors and uh, why I don't think other methods, uh, while they, well, they are valid and they are still considered soul winning, why I don't think they're the most effective because, um, you know, when you compare, you know, what would you replace door knocking with, um, they don't seem to do the same job, I think, as door knocking does. But, you know, let's first come at it from the perspective of, you know, comparing passive ways of soul winning, passive ways of soul winning, you know, versus proactive ways of soul winning. So by passive, I mean, uh, you know, non-confrontational. Uh, you know, you don't initiate the discussion. You don't initiate any communication. Um, and really, there's only one method when it comes to a passive way of soul winning. And that's what we would, you know, know as lifestyle evangelism, where, you know, you just live your life and you just, you know, have a good testimony and you wait for people to come to you to ask you, you know, what do you have and to ask you, you know, what you believe. You don't initiate that, um, that, that conversation at all. And what are the problems with lifestyle evangelism? Well, number one is it only reaches people that you know. I mean, if you have a, only a passive form of soul winning, how then are we reaching people that we don't know? I mean, think about it. If the first disciples only did passive soul winning, how would the gospel have gotten anywhere else? It would have just stayed within their circle because, you know, back in those times, you know, we weren't connected through technology. We weren't connected through international uh, 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 relationships and things like that. You know, there were communities of people that were totally disconnected from other communities. So how does that message of the gospel go from one community to the next if we only do this passive form of lifestyle evangelism. And, you know, I would say people that promote, you know, lifestyle evangelism or promote a passive form of evangelism or soul winning, um, you know, if your philosophy, if your philosophy of soul winning or evangelism puts an upper limit on how many people to reach, I think you need a new philosophy in soul winning. Because if Jesus is saying, uttermost part of the earth, preach the gospel to every creature, teach all nations, but your philosophy is, well, I'm only going to stick to this circle or the people I come across in my day-to-day life. That obviously is not aligned with the goal that Jesus gave us, which is to preach the gospel to every creature. So if somebody has an upper limit on who they should reach, where their circle of responsibility ends, if it's not the uttermost part of the earth, then that needs to change because that's the upper limit that Jesus Christ himself gave us. You know, uh, Michael, me and uh, Kevin, we were soul winning in San Susi. uh, I'm pretty sure it was San Susi. And I was was partnered with Kevin. And we came across this uh, this Greek Orthodox guy who, you know, wasn't wasn't aggressive or rude, but, um, you know, when we knocked on his door, he basically made the comment of, you know, you you don't need to go out and to to bother people and to, to tell people. He's like, he said, you know, we live in the information age. We live in the age where people can go on the internet, you know, they really want to know uh, about Jesus. They really want to research about spiritual things. They'll look it up. You know, you don't need to to go to them and tell them. There's nothing you can tell them that they can't find themselves. And, you know, he's got a valid point because, you know, you can find whatever you want. But that's not the only reason why we need to do a confrontational sort of evangelism because I explained to him, yes, 
if people are looking, if people are trying to find answers, they can find the answers. They'll go on the internet and they'll find all the information they need. The problem is most people don't. Because people are busy, people are uh, living amongst the thorns, you know, just to speak from that parable. You know, they're busy, they're not thinking about things like that. So part of the reason why we need to have a confrontational or proactive sort of evangelism where we go and talk to people when they're not thinking about it is hopefully it'll spark them to think about it. Um, and it'll, it'll bring up that conversation. And I was saying to this guy, you know, today, you probably weren't thinking about spiritual things. You weren't thinking about where you were going when you die today. But now that we're here, hopefully it'll cause you to think about it. Even though, you know, you're not going to give us the time to explain, hopefully he'll read the pamphlet and he'll think about that question that we have on the front of our pamphlet, which is, if you die today, are you 100% sure that you go to heaven? So passive, passive uh, versus proactive. So we know that passive, you know, not only is it not scriptural, it doesn't reach everybody. Um, and you know, not everybody is concerned with how you're living your life. They're probably very concerned with how they're living their life and the problems that they have. Um, and people are just by nature self-centered, aren't they? So let's look, at, look, let's look at it from a proactive point of view what the different methods are within the proactive or confrontational category. And you know, you know, being proactive about evangelism, that's really the only way that you're going to reach people that you don't know, right? You can't reach somebody you don't know or you've never met before by any sort of passive um, or lifestyle evangelism. And I, in my mind, I've broken this into three categories that I think covers all the different methods that are out there. And, you know, number one, I've, I've called like a broadcasting type message, a, a broadcasting type uh, method where, you know, you are proactive, meaning you're making it a point to, to do something, you know, out of your normal life to, to talk to people or get the message out to people that you wouldn't normally come across. And what I would put in this uh, broadcasting type category is, you know, open air preaching. Open air preaching is one where, you know, you may set up somewhere and stand in a box where there's a lot of people present and then you broadcast that message, right? And you're just basically yelling it and, or, or trying to get their attention, trying to draw a crowd in a public place. Now, what are the issues with open air preaching? Well, number one is it takes a lot of boldness, doesn't it? I mean, you know, I, I would say some of you probably would be fearful to stand in front of a crowd of people that you know and, and share something. You know, how much more fearful is it if you have that issue to stand in front of a crowd of people you don't know that might be adverse to what you're saying uh, and then stand up and give a clear, loud presentation? Uh, that takes a lot of boldness. You know, it also takes a very loud voice. You know, not all of us have the sort of voice that projects, um, that is, is maybe easy to understand, whatever. It requires a loud voice. You know, number three, it only works in a public place where many people are present. Because in a private place, probably somebody doesn't want you shouting over everyone and, and, and screaming at everybody. Um, so it's only going to work in a public place where you're even allowed to do it. And it's only going to work when many people are present, right? Because let's say you go somewhere and you want to preach open air and there's only one person sitting there. I mean, you, you probably think, the, the person's probably thinking, why are you shouting at me? Why don't you just, why don't you just talk to me? So it's only going to work when there's a lot of people around um, and in a public place. But number four, an issue I see with open air preaching is, you know, it can, be, it can easily be offensive because it's not, it's, it's not a method where you can share with somebody gently, where you can sit, share with somebody softly, share with somebody privately. I mean, unless you have really good sound equipment, uh, you have to shout and yell this message and it's very hard to seem loving and not seem arrogant when you're just screaming at them and telling them how sinful they are. Uh, it's just hard to come across the right way. I'm sure there is a way, but I'm just saying that it, it would lean towards being um, a, a bit more offensive to people and they may, they may not receive it as well. So broadcasting, like an open-air preaching. What other sort of broadcasting methods are there? Um, the other one I could think of was advertising. You know, you might put billboards up, posters up, uh, you know, letterbox dropping, whatever. Um, you know, maybe, may pay, maybe you might pay for ads on radio, ads in movies, ads in, you know, football events and rugby events, uh, or, you know, ads in, in the previews in movies, but just generally advertising. Now, 
What are a couple of the problems with that? I mean, the obvious one is they're very cost prohibitive, aren't they? I mean, you have to spend a lot of money. I don't know how, even how much, you know, when you drive to my place and you see that billboard across King George, I don't even know how much it would cost to, to put a billboard up. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not against any of these methods. I don't think any of these methods are sinful or they're wrong. Uh, I'm making the case here of why they're not as effective as door knocking. But I think it would be great sometimes to add these onto our door knocking. I mean, if our church you know, did have the money, I mean, it would be great that you know, be putting billboards up and, and putting ads out there. I mean, if you can get a really captivating ad and, and have the money to pay for it to be, to be on during primetime television, I mean, that's something awesome if we ever did that one day. Um, but I don't think it's going to replace door knocking. Number one, it's cost prohibitive. prohibitive. Number two, it's also talent prohibitive. Because, you know, you need somebody that knows how to design, graphic design or knows how to, you know, uh, put, put a video together, uh, the talent to, to be in that video and be able to uh, captivate people in terms of doing that. But you know what I thought about, you know, advertising you know, it's, it's a great way to get a message out to a lot of people, but, you know, it, it seems like it targets the mass audience, but it, it doesn't seem as effective when you just want to get a message to an individual. Because think about it, you might put all these ads on TV, you might, you know, put all these videos online, you might, uh, you know, put this billboard on these busy highways, but what if your neighbour three doors down never watches that show? never sees that ad, never sees that poster or that billboard, never drives on that road. It doesn't matter how much you spend on advertising and how much you pour billions and billions of dollars trying to get this message out to the masses, you're not getting it to the individual that just lives down the street. So, you know, it targets the masses, but it's not going to get every individual because you're not going to catch everyone in that net. Um, so we need a method that gets to those individuals. And the, and the other problem I find with these broadcasting methods is that they're not interactive. It doesn't give a person a chance to, to you, you, it doesn't allow you to make sure that they understand, to ask questions, to, to clarify things. Um, and you know, it's funny because people want to spend all this money getting this message out and all these fancy ways of preaching the gospel when you just think, why can't you just walk up to the people and just talk to them? And it reminds me of that, uh, that parody that IKEA came out with of the IKEA book book and they were making fun of uh, you know Apple. Apple was trying to like make everything so complex and streamlined and all these things and, and so technologically advanced and basically IKEA was making a parody where they were advertising their catalog and saying you know it's, it's very responsive you can even feel the pages and there's zero lag but I just had this idea that you know we're just going back to the basics right everyone wants to make things so complicated and so expensive and so technical where what can be more basic than just walking up to somebody, opening your Bible, asking them whether they have heard the gospel before and explaining it to them. Just going back to being simple. So that's one method of proactive evangelism. Another is what, what I have labeled as um, like invitational or where you invite somebody along to something to, to watch something or to listen to something. And things in this category would be, you know, people that have gospel meetings where you have a meeting where people come and they hear the gospel preached by uh, a professional speaker. Uh, maybe you make a documentary. You make a documentary and when you give it to them, I would classify it in, in this invite category because you're saying, you're inviting them and saying, hey, can you listen to this, uh, this CD or listen to this DVD or watch this movie? Uh, I know some churches put on musical concerts. And they put on, on a concert and you invite all these people to come and listen to the music and then maybe there's a gospel presentation preached. Or maybe you'll create a musical or some sort of entertainment where people are invited along to come and listen. I would put internet media in the same category because you, you, you're inviting people to go to this website to, to read more about it. Um, or something like, you know, Answers in Genesis, which is where they, you know, they created the Creation Museum. They create, like, you know, now they're making the Noah's Ark Encounter. I personally do not prefer to, uh, to support those projects because Answers in Genesis preached the repent of your sins gospel. So whilst I think they have some good material on science, it's hard for me to, with good conscience, put my money towards anything that they do and support that because they don't preach. They preach work salvation. So, but what are some, what are some issues with um, this inviting method? Well, again, a lot of these things that you have to put on, it's very cost and talent prohibitive. 
you know, if you're going to build a creation museum, you need millions and billions of dollars for the land and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and, and I always think, you know, if you're going to spend the time to go invite people to these events, right, if you're going to put on this huge event, now you're going to need some form to, some, some method to tell people about that event, right? So if you make a museum or you make, uh, you have a gospel meeting or you make a documentary, you have a concert or a musical, now pretty much you're going back to the methods in method one, if you're not going to do either door knocking or some sort of one-on-one uh, -on -one soul winning, you're going to go back to either one of the methods in, in the category one, broadcasting the message, to even tell people about that event. And then you sort of think to yourself, well, if I'm going to talk to somebody out wherever and invite them along to an event, I may as well just give them the gospel right there and then, right? So it sort of negates the need for this, these invitational events. I mean, it would support what we're doing, but why would it replace it? Because if you're going to go out and invite people to all these different things and talk to them about something, why not just preach them the gospel at the same time or ask them the question there and then? So you're either going back to number one, which was the broadcasting methods, or you're going on to category three, which is you know, a method where you engage people, where you interact with somebody, and you actually get to discuss um, what you're actually talking about. Now, you know, door knocking obviously fits in that category. And another method, which I really think are, are, the, are the same methods, is whether you go to a public place and, and go and talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, or you go to their house and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. I really think they're the same thing. I know we think of it as you know, street evangelism, and one is door knocking. But the reason why I think that they are the exact same thing is because the only difference between these two methods is where you're doing it, right? The location at which you're trying to engage a person that you've never met before. Um, and, and maybe the timing of it. Because some people, they, you know, they have a proactive evangelism where they don't sort of schedule it, but they just, you know, they'll just take time out of their day whenever they get some time and go talk to some people, which is fine as well. I guess the advantage of something being scheduled is that you make sure you do it. Because if you just do it when you have time or when you feel like doing it, like we discussed last week, chances are you may not do it as often as uh, you should or as you could if you actually made it a point, prioritized it, and scheduled it into your days or into your weeks. So really with this, you're either going to... There's only really two ways you can approach a total stranger, somebody you've never met before, that you never will ever meet in your day-to-day -day life, you're either going to meet them in a public area or you're going to try and meet them at, at, at their home. Really, I don't, know, I don't think there's any other way you're going to meet a stranger um, other than those two methods. Well, why do I think that knocking doors is better than um, trying to stop people and talk to people in public areas? Well, number one, if you just limit yourself to street evangelism, my first question is, well, why, why limit yourself to one area? You know, if you're going to go to the city or you're going to go to, um, you know, I don't know, Bankstown or wherever where there are a lot of people uh, doing things there and you're going to go there and talk to them and try and stop them and, and talk to them about the gospel. My first question is, well, why limit yourself to that, just that one area? Because the only difference between street evangelism and door-to-door -door soul winning is we're just canvassing the whole area because you stop people on the way when they're walking to and from their house or they're out in the shops. Maybe we're on, we're on a street where there are shops we're doing that street as well. So we're not limiting ourselves to just one area and saying, hey, we're just going to go back to that one area um, and talk to people there. We're just going to canvas the whole area. But number two as well, because you're in a public place where there are other people around, people tend to be more self-conscious, don't they? Like when you try and stop somebody, let's say sitting at a bus stop, and there are other people sitting at that bus stop, how the other people respond sometimes depends on how the first person responds. If the first person doesn't want the gospel track, generally the next people don't want to either because people are sheep, people are self-conscious, and when there are other people watching them, they're, they're often thinking, you know, why are you talking to me and not somebody else? You know, why did you stop me? So I just feel that that is a limitation that doesn't happen when you go door to door. People aren't self-conscious. You know, they're in their own area of comfort because they're at their home. You know, number three, I find that it's a bit harder for a new person who's just getting into soul winning, just getting into evangelism to start when it's in a public area. Because not only is it, uh, are the people that you're talking to more self-conscious, 
But the people that are doing it for the first time that maybe aren't as confident as we are, they're a bit more self-conscious as well. Um, so it's a little harder to get them. It's a, it's a larger barrier of fear that they need to get over before they're willing to do something public where a lot of people can see what they're doing. And you know, number four, I find, and you know, these are not hard and fast rules, I mean, hard and fast things, because you know, it doesn't always apply. But you know, in my opinion, it's, it, I find that when you try and stop people in a public area that are out and about, more often than not, they're busy doing something. You know, because when I am out and about, I'm out and about because I need to get somewhere. I need to do something. I need to buy something. Like, I've got a schedule that I need to keep to because there's things I need to do. You know, I don't always have time to stop. And yes, you know, there are people that are out there that are just hanging around, that are just, you know, loitering or you know, wasting time or, you know, spending time with friends that, are, that do have the time to talk. And that's why I'm totally not against, you know, street evangelism because that's just part of canvassing, right? It's just part of preaching to everybody. I think there's a, there's a time and a place for it, but I wouldn't totally replace street evangelism with door knocking for the reasons that I've mentioned. So let's get on to door knocking. So we've talked about, you know, uh, passive forms of evangelism, and then we've got the proactive forms of evangelism where you broadcast a message, you advertise, you open air preach, you know, or you invite somebody to an event that you're organizing, and then we've got the, in the, uh, the engaging and discussion, discussion and interacting type methods, which is either street evangelism, and then we get on to door knocking, which is what we do. So we've already talked about why the other methods I don't think are as effective as door knocking and what are some advantages to door knocking? Well, number one is, you know, everybody in an area lives somewhere, don't they? So it's a systematic way of at least attempting to reach every single person in a geographical location. Um, you know, number two, so that's number one, everyone lives somewhere. Number two, it's systematic, right? Because we can, we can track where we've been, you know, how, how, how much we've gone through, and that's what we're doing with Spotio, and um, you know, hopefully we'll get a map up there soon where we can actually highlight it and something you can see as soon as you come here. You know, number three, where we were talking about you know, in a public setting with, uh, versus a private setting, because you know, when, I feel when you go to somebody's house, they're in their domain, aren't they? So they're the one in control, they're the one in charge, we're the ones that are coming to a, a, a situation where they are comfortable. So I feel that it's easier for them to open up because they're a bit more confident. They're, 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 they're where they're, they feel safe. And it's better. And as soon as you start that conversation and you get into that conversation, you're in a private setting. Nobody else is watching. Nobody else is listening. And I think it's a really great sort of setting for people to have that, um, that conversation. You know, number four, it's, it's low cost. You know, it doesn't, doesn't cost millions and billions of dollars for property and you know, talent and all that sort of stuff, uh, advertising. And, you know, I can't remember what number I'm up to, but the next one is, um, you know, it's personalized, isn't it? When you, when you talk to somebody one-on-one, -on -one, you don't have to just, when, when, see, when you broadcast a message, you have to have a cookie-cutter method for everybody that might listen to your message. But when you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, you can cater what you're talking about to that person's concerns, that person's questions. And you just cannot do that with some sort of mass marketing type method. They can talk, you know, they can ask questions, you know, you can ask them questions, you can clarify things, and that's not something you can do with any other method that is a uh, mass audience. And think about this, guys. You know when politicians campaign? You know, when, when politicians want to get their name out there and they want to engage the community, what do they do? They knock doors, don't they? So they knock doors because they know that's how you reach everyone. There's a reason why salespeople and, and politicians knock on people's doors to try and talk to them about community issues, talk to them about you know, uh, issues that are happening in government because they know that is the only way they can reach every single citizen in the area what other method can do it and that's why we do it we don't do it because you know I don't personally believe that the Bible has mandated that this is the method that uh, everyone does we do see the example of apostles and disciples going house to house and, and, and preaching the gospel in every house but people can make the argument well it's because they didn't have the internet back then they didn't have TV back then so you know I'll give them that that you know we can use things like the internet and technology and you know we can record 
the sermons and put them on the internet. So we can't take this hard line of, well, because that's all we see in the New Testament, it means other methods are not what God intended or are sinful or are wrong. But we can make the argument of why, you know, Jesus didn't need all these things because it is the most effective way, in my opinion, of how to get the gospel out there. But what are some, what are some problems or objections to door knocking? There's really, there's really only like two I can think of, and I don't know whether they're really objections, but you know, one is uh, you know, that people don't like it. You know, people don't like you coming up to them and talking to them and coming to their property. And, um, but let me ask you, is there any method that, that people will like, that everyone will like? There's no, there's no method of telling people about Jesus that everybody is going to like. So that's not going to stop me from you know, going to their house and talking to them for the other reasons that I've uh, mentioned. And the other one, which I don't even know is, is an objection, where people would say, well, what if, I, what if a person is not able to walk or not able to talk? Well, you know, I think the exception proves the rule. You know, well, you know, obviously people normally can walk and normally can talk if, if they're just, you know, because if it wasn't for the curse, and they can do it. And if, you know, if they can't walk and they can't talk, then, you know, then they have these other methods that they can get involved in. All right, so let's uh, look at Ephesians 6. So that's my reasoning there with why I think door knocking is the best, why I think it's the most effective, and why I think that's where we will focus most of our time on in this church. Now, you know, this, this sermon is about soul winning tips. So just first wanted to cover why we do door knocking. But um, let, let's just talk about, talk about soul winning as well. Talk about you know, what I think a good comparison with soul winning is. And it's obviously a fight. And we, we read in Ephesians 6, uh, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So, you know, we are in this fight, and, and, and the Bible likens this fight to wrestling. wrestling. Now, when I, when I think of, when, when you think of, um, and, and you know, I don't know if you guys ever wondered, do you ever wondered how the different parts of God's armor actually correspond with everything? I don't know if you guys have ever heard a sermon. I, I haven't actually heard a sermon about uh, what all the different parts um, of the armor and how, what makes them significant. But um, you know, my idea is, and I don't know if this is, the, this is the right answer, but the thought I came up with, when it says having your loins girt about with truth, you know, truth is almost like the belt that keeps your pants up, right? Or keeps whatever you're wearing down here up. And you know, why do we wear pants? Why do we wear those clothes? Well, it's to hide our nakedness, isn't it? So the thought I had when we have our loins girt about with truth, it's almost like truth is what is keeping us from being ashamed. And that verse in 1 John 2 comes to mind where it talks about, you know, abide in the truth that we won't be ashamed before him at his coming. Uh, so you have your loins girt about with truth, then you have the breastplate of righteousness. So how, why is it a breastplate of righteousness? And the thought there is, well, the breastplate is to protect your heart. So if you're walking in the Spirit and you have the righteousness of God coming through you, your heart is right with God, and, and, and that's what I, how I think it relates to um, the spiritually, uh, keeping your heart right, the, the righteousness of God. And then you have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, verse 15, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So there's a preparation there to, to get ready 
to, to bring the gospel out, isn't it? So the fact that it's shoes and you're shodding yourself, when you put your shoes on, you're ready to leave, aren't you? When you come home, you take your shoes off. When you're ready to go somewhere and you're ready to leave, you put your shoes on. And that's why the gospel of peace is something that we are meant to be proactive about. We're meant to go and preach the gospel. And then you have the shield of faith. So why is faith considered a shield? Because when you're fighting and you're holding a shield, generally the shield is there to defend you from things that you're not looking at, right? You're fighting with your, with your sword and you're holding your shield and you've got your eyes forward and you're just, you've got that shield there to, to defend you from anything that you don't have your eyes on, things that you're not expecting, things that, you ha that, you, that you're unaware of. And that's what faith is like because, you know, the, the devil may throw a, a, a curveball at you, right? Where a question that you don't know how to answer, a contradiction that you may not know the answer to or uh, some sort of objection to the gospel. But faith says, you know what, I don't know the answer, but I'm going to believe the Bible anyway until I know the answer. So that's why it's a shield of faith that protects you from the unexpected. And what else was there? Shield of faith, where you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. So I was thinking, why is salvation a helmet? And, and my first thought was, maybe you guys have some thoughts on this too, but the helmet of salvation, because when people don't know whether they're saved, they're consumed with that, aren't they? Their mind is consumed with figuring out, am I saved or not? They're doubting their salvation. But when you know you have salvation, I think what it does is it, keeps you, it gives you a sound mind so that you can, it protects your, your mind. Um, that's why it's a helmet. And the last one is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of, of God, which is the Bible, which is our, our offensive weapon, isn't it? Our sword. And that's what we use. Because, you know, the Bible likens... You know, evangelism and soul winning in a fight. But we're not actually, we're not in a physical fight. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Ours is a spiritual fight. It's a, it's a fight of words, isn't it? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The fight that we're in is, is a battle of the mind. It's a battle of words. And that's why the word of God is, is our weapon. Because it's where all our words should be based on. So sorry, a bit of a rabbit trail there, but I thought that might be interesting to you because... You know, I was just thinking about it when I went to that verse. But, you know, when nowadays, if you were to think of fighting and, and public fighting, right? What, what is the first thing, I don't know, what's the first thing that comes to mind for you guys? When, when I think of the public realm, when people think about competitive fighting, now the big craze is UFC, isn't it? UFC, if you don't know what that stands for, is the ultimate fighting championships. And that's, the, the, you know, whenever you see now fighting on Facebook where people post clips. It's usually clips from the UFC, you know, two men, two men in a ring. They've got little gloves on and they're just, there's no specific style at all. They're just two men, two men, no hold bars, and they just uh, fight, you know, one goes in, one comes out. Um, but a lot of people don't know that um, the UFC, the, the, the Ultimate Fighting Championships, actually started with a certain style called Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. How many of you guys knew that? No, oh, okay. So, no, 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 no fighting fans here, so this will be new to you. I'll sound like an expert, even though I'm not. But the UFC started with, it, with one style of fighting, which was called Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and Jiu-Jitsu is a type of wrestling. It started in Japan, that's why it sounds Japanese, Jiu-Jitsu, and what happened is uh, the Brazilians learnt it, a family by the name of Gracie, and then they took it to Brazil, and it became what, was, what is now known as Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and the most famous type of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, named after the Gracie family. And it was that family that would, you know, would challenge people to fight and people would challenge them to show that their method of fighting was the most effective. And they ended up taking that to America where it became huge, where, you know, and then they, they had what was called the Ultimate Fighting Championship where any technique could come and there was no rules and it was just whoever won that fight. But now, when you think about the UFC, it's not just one method anymore. Because when the UFC started, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was dominant. But now when you hear about what sort of fighting styles that they do, it's all about MMA. Have you guys heard of that? MMA? So MMA stands for Mixed Martial Arts. Because they started to realize that the most effective form of any sort of martial art was not to limit yourself to one method, but you had to learn all methods. You had to learn all the techniques and then they would 
they would have a technique that isn't really just one technique, they would call it mixed martial arts because you'd have to learn everything and then that's what would make you effective. Why does that make you effective? Because number one, when you learn all different sorts of martial arts, you know, number one, how to defend against all the different types of martial arts, don't you? You know how they're going to attack. You know how the maneuvers that they're going to try and get you into, how they strike, how they kick. So not only do you know how to defend against it, you're also going to know how they defend. So it's very effective for somebody to be a mixed martial artist because they know if I attack this way, this is probably how they're going to defend and I know to come this way or submit this way or wrestle them this way. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, you know, we're in a spiritual fight. And I think some people have the frame of mind where if they just have one method, that's the one cookie cutter method for everybody. But I think if we can learn a lesson just from physical fighting, people have started to realize one method isn't just going to cut it. One, and I'm going to clarify, but I mean, you know, the, but one method, you need, to, you need to learn different things. You need to have different ways to explain things, different, you know, know what, what other religions believe. You need to be not, not ignorant of all these things. Yes, everyone gets the same, saved the same way. So I'm not saying that there's a different method of being saved. Everyone has to believe on Jesus Christ. But how we have that conversation, how we address objections, how we explain things, how we approach a Muslim is going to be different to how we approach a Jehovah's Witness, how we approach a Pentecostal, somebody that's been in church, that's, that's familiar with the gospel. We're going to have a different type of conversation. And if we just limit ourselves to one martial art, we're not going to be as effective as we could, right? Because we want to be you know, spiritual uh, mixed martial artists. So, you know, if you, if you are more knowledgeable about different methods, different martial arts, and we just go back to physical fighting, you know, number one, you're going to know how to defend against it. Number two, you're going to know how to attack it. But number three, you're probably going to enjoy the fight more, aren't you? Like, not saying that we necessarily need to have fun out there, but, you know, if you go into a fight not knowing anything at all, and you just get your butt whooped, I mean, that's, like, that's not going to be very enjoyable. I mean, even if, you know, when people play competitive sports, even though you get, you know, you may get totally creamed and, and, and not even put up a fight. If you know you put in your best fight and, and you know, you know, I've been training for this and been preparing for this and, you know, I lost, but I put up a good fight, you wouldn't feel as bad as somebody that just goes in and just doesn't know what they're doing, totally ignorant and just, you know, just, just embarrassing. You know, and it, that's why when, when you watch a ball game and it's very close, you're like, oh, that was a really good game. But when they just get totally smashed, you're like, that wasn't even fun to watch. It was just embarrassing. So, you know, you're probably going to enjoy the fight more if you, you know, are a bit more knowledgeable about things and, and, and not so ignorant about other religions that are out there. And, and, and also, when you talk to the person at the door, you're not going to seem as ignorant, you know, because you do know a bit about it. Um, and, and that's why it's great when, uh, you know, I, I talk to somebody out door to door and they ha do believe something that's different. I, wa I want to learn a bit about it, take that opportunity to say, you know, what, what does that teach? What does that believe? Because maybe I'll run into another person and I already know and I already have sort of formulated a, a, an approach to talk to that sort of person and the next time I come across it. So you know what, I encourage everybody here to, to not be ignorant of false doctrine, not be ignorant of false religion, you know, learn about these things. But I will say this, learn about all different false religion, but you should be most expert at the Bible. Because some people get a bit un imbalanced there, where they just start learning about false doctrine, start learning about false religion, and that's all they're focusing on, to the point where they don't even really know the Bible that well. You know, they think they know the Bible that w really well, but they don't. They just know a couple of verses here and there. They know the verses that they need to combat a false doctrine, but they don't know the whole Bible. Um, and we don't, not, we don't want to be imbalanced like that. So in Matthew 10, verse 16, we see Jesus say here, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So Christ is telling the, the 12 here in Matthew 10 that he wants them to be wise, wise as serpents. So what does that mean to me? I mean, a serpent, if you think that the embodiment of a serpent was Satan himself, you know, Satan, you know, a serpent is, is subtle, aren't they? 
So they're not over, 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 overly froward. So when we preach the gospel out there, we shouldn't just be in somebody's face and, and really forward. We should come across as subtle, you know, and, 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 and be subtle like, like a serpent and, and try and, you know, ease into the conversation, ease into certain things so that it's a bit easier for them to receive. Why is a serpent? So, you know, a serpent is very smart as well, isn't it? You know, Satan is very knowledgeable. He's very knowledgeable about what's false out there. He's also very knowledgeable about God's word. Because remember, he went to Jesus and he, he uh, quoted God's word. So that tells me we need to be knowledgeable about things. We need to understand God's word. We need to un know the Bible. We need to understand the nature of man. I mean, Satan, he knew the nature of man, didn't he? When he went to tempt Eve, he tempted Eve with the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. He was knowledgeable about how men were, how men reacted. And we want to be knowledgeable about that too but wise as serpents verse 16 and harmless as doves so the only difference is we are wise as a serpent not to harm people and to cause people to fall we want to be wise as serpents because we want to help people we want to be harmless we don't want to to hurt them that's the only difference now i wanted to show you a video i thought it had something to do with the sermon it's, it's a video from an interview from a place called The Dean Show. Now, you know, obviously I do not endorse The Dean Show. You know, he is simply just a, 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 an interviewer, but he is actually of the Muslim faith. So I think they use that as a platform to preach Islam. But the reason why I just wanted to show you this, because it was an interview with Hoyce Gracie, who was, he's part of the Gracie family um, about the jujitsu. So it gives you a bit of a background on where the UFC came from. But there's something he says at the end that I think is really interesting uh, that I wanted to tie into this sermon. So let's just, um, I'll just show you this video. Hopefully you find it interesting. Let's go, through some, let's go through some of these fights. People are seeing this big guy. I believe his name is Kimo, right? And again, we're talking to some people. Many people don't know about Gracie's Jiu Jitsu. They still think that, look, man, I, I, uh, uh, nobody's taking me to the ground. So now you're on the ground right here. And people are thinking, okay, you got this 250 plus pound guy, muscle, pure muscle. What are you, what are you about? Uh, a buck, 180. You're 180. At that time, you're around same 180. What's your dad? 20 now, years. Now, <laughs> we, we see your dad's there. He's telling you something. He's telling you something. You're, you're on your back. What are you thinking at this time? Well, what happened is. Um, to prove the effectiveness of his grace jiu-jitsu, we, back in Brazil, my father, my uncles, my cousins, my brothers, start to challenge people to see which style is the best. And there's only one way to find out. Get in a cage, in a ring, and take all the rules, weight divisions, there's no time limit, no gloves, no rules. And we've been doing that in Brazil for many years. My brother, Horan, came to America and brought the same concept to America and create the UFC. So, but the, in the beginning, 20 years, 21, now 21 years ago, it was an eight-man tournament. So you had to fight three fights in one night. And I defeat all my opponents, three fights, without breaking a sweat, just showing the technique of the, that my father created. Mm -hmm. So that, once America found out, was what happens in Brazil, people don't know. But once America found out, it spread out all over the world. All over the world. Then the second UFC, my brother Horton made the, the tournament. It was uh, a 16-man tournament, so it was four fights in one night. So you had to fight four fights in the same night with no time limit, no weight division, no rules. Everything goes mm -hmm. in a cage. Two men walk in, one walk out, and I beat four opponents in the same night. Now, right? Somebody has a 200, all the opponents, there's no weight, limit, no weight limit, no weight division. So I'm fighting guys, I'm 180, I'm fighting guys 250, 270, 280. Just their professional, their style, fighting that sumo wrestler against a kickboxer, against a, a wrestler, against a judo player, against a boxer. The best of the best. So this is like the best in karate. The best and athletes. I mean, not just okay, a black belt karate, but they're at the top of their level, correct? They're at the top of the level. But then, the, what I mean was, uh, what impressed the most, it was that I'm, was, I was the smallest person, beating the guys who were not just bigger, but beating them without having to smash their face, submitting them with the technique, 
with a choke, with an unlock, and they will quit and like get out clean face without having to be smashed up. And so it's not a violent <laughs> yeah. art, it's a self-defense art. As gentle as possible. Yes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 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 now Good with kindness. With kindness. That's right. That's so important. Yes. And now you proved. Obviously, this is uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Have you ever had somebody now today? I know there was in the Gracie Academy. There was a, tell us about the time. It was it open for anyone? It was a challenge, but anyone can come in. There's old footage people are seeing right now that now this is in the academy. This is even before the UFC. It was a challenge. Like how how, how did you guys set that up? Before the UFC, there was a. I mean, there was always a student that trained karate or trained wrestling. And he would come in and it's like, man, my karate instructor, I told him about you guys, and he said he doesn't believe. So we said, well, bring him on, bring him over. We'll be glad to talk to him about it. So he'll bring the instructor over, and the instructor is like, well, I don't think he can take him to the ground. So we kind of, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a fight, because we never beat them up. Yeah. We just take them down, we're more baptizing them, <laughs> turn them into a, turn them into a, uh, believers in Gracie Jiu Jitsu. In Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So we take them down with more looking like, okay, my brother will always say, man, don't beat this guy up too bad. He's going to be a future student. Mm. So we treat them as a future student. So the guy will come in and I'll take them down, not even a slap to the face, just control them and show it to them. Then they'll be like, oh man, I'm trying my best over here. And voice is doing nothing, just controlling, taking me to the ground, taking me out of my game. It's embarrassing. Can I learn this? <laughs> <laughs> and again, with kindness and gentleness, this is amazing. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you found that interesting. So, it's, you know, that's why it's interesting when you think about the fight that we're in. I think that this whole MMA, UFC, Jiu Jitsu analogy really fits because it's interesting that they found that the most effective form of martial art at the time, anyway, was this whole wrestling submission technique. And what made it so famous is because Hoist Gracie, which was the guy that got interviewed, in the very first two UFCs, he was the, uh, the representative of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And they purposely put in somebody that was much smaller than the other opponents to prove its effectiveness. And I sort of feel like that's the same with God's word. You know, when you have the right technique, when you have the right methods, you don't have to be some big name, eloquent speaker. If you've got the truth, you're going to be the most effective. And it turns out that the most effective form of martial art was one that was so like graceful and so gentle. You know, like remember how he was saying, you know, we, he could end the fight and it wasn't all bloody and it wasn't that they had to be all smashed up like the other, you know, striking arts were. He would just submit them, basically get them to give up and then the fight would be over. But the last thing, I don't know if you caught that at the end there, and this is the sort of the point I want to springboard into. You know how they, they said people would come to their academy, right? They would welcome any challenges. And that's what I, I think we should have that frame of mind too. We welcome any challenge, anybody to challenge the Word of God um, because we believe the truth will stand. So people would come into their academy, right, and challenge them. And you notice what he said? He said, my brother would always tell me, always, don't beat this guy up too bad because one day he's going to be a future student. And... I just thought that was interesting that people that fight in the physical realm still have this mentality, hey, you know, we're going to get challenged, but there's a right way to deal with that challenge because we don't want to create an enemy. We want to create a future student. We want that person to go away thinking what's different and then have, have that open communication and that kindness to be able to come back. So we want to think that way and say, hey, don't beat this guy up too bad in terms of spiritually because one day they may be a future disciple. Um, and, and what I want to sort of talk about now uh, a bit is, you know, there is, a, there is a right way and there's a wrong way to give the gospel. You know, there's, a, there's a right way and there's a wrong way to give the gospel. Um, Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So there is a right way to speak to somebody and there's a wrong way to speak to somebody. You speak to somebody the right way, it turns away wrath. You speak to somebody the wrong way, grievous words, it's actually going to make them angry. And the Bible says here that if you're wise, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. 
So a wise man is not just somebody that knows knowledge and just throws it out however, you know, let the chips fall where they may, in, in that sort of sense. You know, you don't just, it's not just, oh, I'm just telling them the truth and they just have to deal with it. No, the Bible does not tell us at all to talk like that to people. It says the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. There's a right way to use knowledge and there's a wrong way to use knowledge. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. So a fool doesn't control his mouth. Words just pour out and um, they don't care how it affects the other person. Now, you know, you cannot always control what the other person thinks. So I don't always, I'm not saying that the blame is totally on the person that's doing the offense, offending because it takes two to tango, right? Somebody has to be offended in order for those words to be offensive. So sometimes you will do your best to not be uh, offensive, but the person is still going to get angry. But what I'm saying is, you know, as children of God, as, as, as representatives of Christ, we should always have the mentality that we are striving not to upset people. Even though, you know, sometimes when we speak, when we speak peace, they are for war. Um, let's look at Philippians. Philippians 1. Verse 15 says here, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. So there's two types of people preaching the gospel two ways. They preach Christ of envy and strife, some of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my bonds. So what do we see there? One type of Christian is preaching Christ to get into a fight. They're not sincere about their motive, about why they actually are trying to explain the gospel to somebody. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds, you know, in, in terms of what Paul is saying, because he's in jail and it's adding you know, trouble to the fact that he's already in jail. But what I get from that is, you know, if you preach the gospel the wrong way, with the wrong motive, um, not sincerely, and you're trying to be contentious, then you're going to make it harder for other Christians, aren't you? You're going to add afflictions to bonds. He says, but the other of love. And remember what we talked about last week, the right reasons to preach the gospel. It's out of love. It's of goodwill, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So, you know, I'm not upset at anybody, or, and I don't think anyone is doing this at all. So I'm not preaching this because people, I think anyone's doing it. But I know it's out there. And, and, you know, that's the frame of mind we should have. Like Paul said, hey, you know, whether it's preached the wrong way or whether it's preached the right way, I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. So he's still happy that the gospel is getting out there, but that doesn't mean that it's all right to do it the wrong way. We want to strive to do it the right way. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10. We'll see here. Just So basically what I'm talking about now is, you know, the, the way in which we should talk to people when we go soul winning. Uh, look at what's written here in 2 Corinthians 10. Now I, Paul, bes myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. So you see, when Paul, when Paul tr tried to exhort and to, and to encourage the believers at Corinth, he didn't come across harsh, did he? He didn't come across offensive. It says here, I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. So it gives you an idea of how he came across to these people. I mean, he was very firm because we know the things that are written in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. So he was very firm in what he said, but we also get a glimpse into how he approached these people. Um, who in presence and base among you. So he says, when I'm with you, I'm humble, I'm base, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. So he's saying that, you know, I don't want to be that guy when I come, that nobody likes, and be bold. Uh, wherewith I think to be bold against some. So there are some that I got to be like that with, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So there again, we, we're in a spiritual battle. We're not in a, a physical battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted it itself against the knowledge of god and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of christ so we see there that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal they're spiritual they they take captive people's thoughts and every imagination every high thing that exalted the, itself against the knowledge of god so we're in this battle of the mind we're in this battle of words 
And the point I just want to make here is, you know, if we're in a spiritual fight, then we ought to use spiritual weapons. So if we're not in a carnal fight, we shouldn't use carnal weapons. So in a spiritual fight, don't use carnal weapons. So what are our spiritual weapons? Well, we read in Ephesians 6, it's the Word of God. We use the Word of God. We use, uh, we, we, we saw prayer. Um, you know, the fruit of the Spirit. You know, these are some examples of spiritual weapons. And uh, one thing that a uh, bishop in Perth taught me was, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. So when you go soul winning, you go with love, right? You share with joy and you leave with peace. So that was one thing that he always said. You know, when you go soul winning, share with, you, you go with love, you, sh you share with joy, make sure you leave with peace. Um, I thought that was some really good advice. You know, what are some unspiritual weapons? You know, the works of the flesh, and we're going to go into some of these now, but, you know, the works of the flesh, you know, pride, you know, boasting, you know, being condescending, uh, without understanding is, 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 a, is a sin of the flesh. Um, not having understanding, that's why we shouldn't be ignorant about things. You know, strife. Now, you know, I'm all for debate, I'm all for discussion, but there's a point, and I think you guys all know, when a discussion becomes contentious, it becomes strife. You can disagree without being contentious. Um, and we should strive as much to, to not have strife, not be angry. You know, there's nothing to get angry about when we're, when we're preaching the gospel to people. If we're getting angry, then it just means we're getting proud, isn't it? And frowardness. Frowardness is a, is a work of the flesh. So, you know, it's, it's being, uh, you know, too full on with people and, uh, and not being subtle like we talked about. Um, let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 29. The Bible says here, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is, the, which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we see there that how we talk is very important. We want talk that builds people up. And we get, a, we get an idea here that the building up, we, we build up by ministering grace unto the hearers. We're gentle in that, you know, that meek and... Um, you know, the meekness and gentleness of Christ, as Paul uh, mentioned in a previous verse we looked at. Um, let's look at Proverbs 15. Oh, I think I might have already actually gone here. I might have this twice in my... Yeah, I already, I already went to that one. So we want to see here, let's go to James. James chapter 4, verse 6. And these are all familiar verses to us, but just to remind us of how the frame of mind we should have when we go soul winning. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now this is not the only time we see this. We see this in 1 Peter 5 as well. In verse 5 it says, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now, I don't know if you guys realize this, but this is actually uh, a quote from the Old Testament in Proverbs 3.34. That's why it says, For he saith, it is written. I always wondered where it was in the Old Testament, so I went to look for it, and I'm pretty sure it's this verse, Proverbs 3.34. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. So there's that God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace to the humble. Now, one thing if you notice about Peter, what's the context there? Is it unbelievers or believers? Believers, isn't it? And same with James. I guess he's addressing believers, isn't he? He's, he's addressing, um, you know, people that aren't doing the right thing. But, you know, whenever we think of that verse, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble, when we think about it in something, we always apply it to the unbeliever, don't we? We say, if they're too proud to res to, to accept God's grace, God is resisting them because they're proud. They're not humble enough to ex receive the grace of God, receive salvation. But these verses are always in the context of believers. And not that I don't think it doesn't apply to unbelievers, but you know, maybe they're in the context of believers because it's more important that we're not proud than it is for the person who's hearing us to be proud. You know, yes, is God going to resist them if they're proud? Yes. But I don't want God resisting me. You know, when I go out and I give the gospel and I'm talking to people, I don't want to have pride because I don't want the Spirit of God resisting me. I want God to give me grace 
I need to be humble so that God will use me to preach to other people. So I thought that was a good point there. Let's look at James uh, 1, 19. Another tip for soul winning. It says here, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So when we go out there and we talk to people, you know, make sure that you're listening to them. You know, don't cut them off all the time. And you know, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I mean, for those of you who are solving with me, I'm sure I've broken every single one of these rules. But, you know, this is what we should be striving for. You know, when we talk to people, you know, that we are swift to hear. When they want to uh, express an objection or they want to express an opinion, let's listen to them. And, you know, that's going to be, make you more effective as well when, you, when you're going soul winning because if you know what they believe, you can tie that into what you're going to say to them. So let every man be swift to hear, quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So you know, think about what you're going to say and, and don't get angry. For the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of God. Uh, Colossians 4. Look at this verse. It says here, <clears throat> Continue in prayer, verse 2, and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. So we should be praying that God will use us, that God will give us the words to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now, here's what I wanted to point, point out to you. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Now, I think us that are amongst independent Baptist churches, fundamental churches, you know, we have come, we, we have this frame of mind that it's just, this is the truth, accept it or reject it, and we come across with a lot of salt, right? We have a lot of salt in our speech. But how does the Bible say we're meant to talk? Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. So there's nothing wrong with the truth, but it seems like it's saying here that, you know, the, the, the hard truths that are, are more salty, you have to put just a little bit on there so it's easier for that person to digest that spiritual food. I mean, if we're going to make hamburgers later on, and, you know, the, the, the patties are like 99% salt and 1% meat. <laughs> it's not going to be a very pleasant patty. You probably aren't going to be eating it. So we don't want our soul winning to be like that. We don't want our soul winning to be 99% salt and 1% grace. We want it to be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And it's just interesting that he says here, that ye may know how or in what way ye ought to answer every man. So this is how we should be talking to people, grace seasoned with salt. I'm all for the truth, but you know, we have to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. And, and God is giving us, I believe, some, some tips here on how we ought to talk to people. And I just want to drum this in a bit further. We see here in, in uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 24. Now obviously this is a charge to bishops and deacons, leaders of churches, but, you know, we are all a servant of God in, in, in one sense or another, and we all should be striving for that same, that same standard. It says here in verse 24 in 2 Timothy 2, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So when you read these verses that we've been going through, do you see somebody that's just harsh with somebody? That's just, you know, this is how it is, whether you like it or not. No, you see, you see the gentleness, you see the meekness, you see the patience there. In, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them the uh, repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 1 Peter 3, this is a very famous verse when it comes to apologetics made famous by answers in Genesis. It says here, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Right? And that's usually what people think about, right? Hey, I just need to have an answer, a reason, of the hope that is in me. But look what it says, with meekness and fear. And if you actually read that whole chapter, it is talking about you know, having compassion, or finally be you all in mind, having compassion one of another, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. So it's, it's about how we deal with our relationships and how we talk to people. 
And just to finish this point here, Romans 12, verse 17. You know, the overarching principle that we could say here, it says here, recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. So we see there, um, uh, you know, that we should not recompense evil for evil. We, as much as life in us, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, so he's saying, Because God will make things right, therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So we see here the frame of mind we should have when we talk to people, when we want to do them good. If they do us evil, do we recompense with evil? No, we shouldn't. We, can, we should recompense with good. So we've talked about why we do door knocking. We've talked a bit about you know, the sort of frame of mind we should have when we go soul winning. And I just wanted to um, go, and I just wanted to give you a couple of practical tips um, of how I go soul winning, and hopefully that would help you. So I just want to spend a bit of time there now. Sorry, I know I'm going really long. If you need to get up and walk around, that's fine. But I wanted to just go through a couple of practical tips that might help you when you go out somewhere because not all of you get a chance to go soul winning with me um, to see how I do it and why I say the things I say. So I just wanted to go through that and hopefully that it'll help you. Now, by no means, I'm not saying that I expect you to do it exactly this way. Um, I don't even think necessarily this may be the best way. This is just what I've learned along the way. But hopefully some of these tips will just help you uh, in your soul winning as you talk to different people. Now, you know, I, I do not think I'm some master soul winner. And, you know, you guys come with me and you know, I don't think I'm the best there is. And I'm always looking at better ways of doing things. These are just some things I've learned along the way. But I would just recommend for you, you know, do what obviously is right. You know, like we talked about, the right way to do things. But for you, do what works. I mean, if you have a method that works, hey, Thank God, right? If it's working for you and you're getting conversations started and people are getting saved, keep doing it. You know, I can probably learn something from you. Um, and do what's comfortable. You know, I'm going to give you some tips here. Don't feel like it's just canned, a canned script that you have to follow because you want to get to the point where you can start a conversation and talk to somebody, give the plan of salvation in a way that is comfortable to you because I think that's more important than you connect with the person on, 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 on a, on a, as a person. You know, and that you don't just come across as somebody that's selling something, that's just making a presentation that they're just sitting through. But let's talk a bit about how I start the conversation. And this is where I, the point that I have got to, um, and the way I do it. And it, it works for me, it's comfortable for me, and I'll explain to you why I do it the way I do it. And, you know, I always... I, I, I put this diagram together because I had a method in my own mind of what I would say when people did, when, when, I, when I knocked on a door and I spoke to people, but then I thought I would map it out and actually show you in a, in a sort of diagram what goes on in my mind when I start a conversation. And whoever goes soul winning with me today will sort of see that I, I don't follow this exactly, but it's sort of what I, what I have. And I, I would recommend starting off with a script. If you're not very confident with soul winning, start off with a script so you know what you're going to say. Because generally when you start soul winning, you're going to be so nervous that you might know your first question, but if you don't know your second question, you might just sort of choke there and not get the conversation to flow, right? And, and once, you, once you create that awkwardness in that situation, it's very hard to, to get rid of it. So I think it's very good to have a script to know what you're going to say next to keep that conversation flowing because it's not that we're trying to manipulate the person or anything, but we want to create an environment that's comfortable so that that person is comfortable and we don't want to just start that conversation where everything's uncomfortable and then they're really not listening to you, they're just thinking about how uncomfortable they are. So when I knock on a door and they answer the door, the first question I ask them is, you know, hi, my name is Victor, I'm handing out a pamphlet that explains how a person can be sure of heaven. Is it okay to leave one with you to read later? Now whether they answer yes or no to that question, it doesn't matter to me. I'll ask them, hey, do you, do you ever think about these things? So whether they say, oh, you know, yes, I'll take the pamphlet, or no, no, thank you, I just ask them, hey, do you ever think about these things? And again, whether they say yes or no, 
whether they say they think about them or sometimes or no, they don't think about it. Then I ask them the question, well, has anyone ever explained it to you? Has anyone ever explained to you what it takes to go to heaven? Or has anyone ever showed you from the Bible um, you know, what it actually takes to be go to heaven? Now, if they say yes, and they say, well, you know, they, they do know or somebody's explained it to them before, then I would ask them the question, well, well then, I would, then I would ask them the question that we all ask them, well, if today was your last day, you know, would you be 100% sure if, if you were to die that your soul would be in heaven? Or would you, have some, would you have some doubt? I think it's great to have that little bit on the end, would you have some doubt? Because if you just ask somebody, you know, you're 100% sure if you were to die today, you would be in heaven, even if somebody's pretty sure, they'll still say yes. But I find it's very good when you ask them, or do you have some doubt? Because then it makes them focus on the doubt that they have. And now they know that they're not 100% sure because they know that they have some doubt and you've brought their attention to that doubt. And, um, you know, if they, if they say yes, then I might ask them, you know, what do you think the reason is that God will let you into heaven? At that point, they might say an objection. They might, you know, and I'll go through a couple of those in, in, in the meanwhile. But when you get to that, you basically will object uh, address the objection or address whatever they've said and this is the end point that I'm trying to get to. I'm just trying to get to that question, well, you know, would it be okay if I took a few minutes to explain it? Because um, if somebody said at that question, if today was your last day, would you be 100% sure you would go to heaven or if you have some doubt and they said no, then I would just go straight to that question. I'd say, well, would it be okay if I just took a couple of minutes to explain it to you? And then you'd get yes or no and if yes, they explain, if no, they might have objections and then you know, it gets a bit more complex as you go from there. Now, uh, just a couple of points on why I have this approach, my reasoning behind this. Now, when I was first taught to go soul winning, a lot of independent Baptists that are taught when they go soul winning, they usually start the conversation by inviting somebody to church. They'll say like, hey, how you doing? My name is Victor. I want to invite you to a Baptist church, or I want to invite you to a local church, or I want to invite you to a Christian church, whatever. But they start that conversation by inviting somebody to church. Now, the reason why I stopped doing that was because I found when I start the conversation with church, I had to get it off church. And then they were just stuck there thinking that I was trying to get them to come to church. and I didn't want that. So that's why I started, started my conversations with, hi, and actually just to tell them what I'm actually doing, right? Because I'm not, I'm not there to invite them to church, am I? I'm there to, to, to explain to them how to go to heaven. So I thought, why don't I just start the conversation that way? So I started saying, hi, my name is Victor. I'm handing out a pamphlet that explains how a person can be sure of heaven. And then I know straight away the topic is on that, uh, the conversation is on that topic. And it's very easy for me to transition into that topic because I'm already on that topic. I don't have to bring up a topic of church and then say, well, you know, it's nothing to do with church. I wanted to actually do this. So that's why I, cho I say it that way. I just find it's a bit more comfortable for me, a bit easier to transition into uh, talking about heaven, talking about the gospel, whether they know for sure they're going to heaven. And, you know, I don't have to try and get off the topic of church. You know, sometimes we even preempt, I even preempt and say, you know, I'm not here to invite you to church. I'm here to, to do this. Sometimes in Australia, I think it makes people just a bit more comfortable because everyone's out there trying to get them along to their thing or get them to join something. And we want to make it clear, like, hey, I'm not here for you to join anything or to commit to anything. I just want to have a conversation with you and explain something to you. Now, why do I say, you know, I'm handing out a pamphlet instead of handing out a gospel tract? So I would, I would uh, not recommend that you use overly Christian words, words that we are very familiar with, but are not necessarily familiar to other people. Because to somebody that's outside of church, what is, it, what is a gospel tract? Before I started going to church, well, even when I was in church for a couple of years, I didn't even know what a tract was. Like, what is a gospel tract? So what is the gospel? You know, people don't even know what that means. You know, they think the gospel is uh, obey Jesus and live a good life. You know, they don't know that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection and just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't use, I don't always try to use words like salvation, justification, sanctification, um, things like that because uh, it doesn't mean anything to them. I want to speak in words that are easy to be understood. So that's why I just say, you know, I'm handing out a pamphlet, I'm handing out a leaflet, I'm handing out a brochure that explains how a person can be sure of heaven. Um, now, the reason why I don't go straight into this question, if today was your last day, would you be 100% sure your soul would be in heaven? Because that question, it's a very offensive question to people. 
And the reason why it's a very offensive question is because most people think you have to do good works to go to heaven. And how many times do you ask people, do you know for sure if you die today you go to heaven? They go, whoa, that's a personal question. They think it's a personal question because it's very inflective of, oh man, they, now they've got to think, am I good, am I bad, how much do I sin, how much do I don't sin? So because it's a very confronting question, people are easily offended by it. And that's why I felt that if I had a different approach where I asked them a few leading questions, it, it, it lessened the blow of the question that I was going to, which was, do you know for sure if you, went to, if you would go to heaven if you died today? You know, and that's why I, I added that question. You know, do you think about these things? So I said, you know, you, you know, do you think about where you go when you die? And, and so I'm sort of, you know, like a serpent, right? I'm subtly going to the question that I want to get to. You know, do you think about these things? Has anyone ex has explained it to you? And I just feel that when, I, when I've asked a couple of those questions and they've sort of have spoken to me a bit already, when I ask them that more confronting question, it's a bit less in your face. And that's why I do it that way. So I say, you know, I'm handing out this pamphlet. You know, do you ever think about spiritual things? Do you ever think about where you go when you die? Um, yes, no. You know, was anyone, anyone ever explained to you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? Yes, no. Uh, yes, you know, well, if, if today was your last day, you know, do you know 100% sure that you'd be in heaven or you have some doubt? Um, and that's how I start the conversation. Now, the last point I'm going to get to here would it be okay if I took a few minutes to explain? I just wanted to mention that I personally always ask for permission to give somebody the gospel. I personally just don't just go straight into it. I know a lot of people that I've gone soul winning with do. And if that works for you, fine. I mean, if it's working, you know, don't stop doing it. The reason why I prefer not to, I have found in my own experience that if I start talking to somebody and I just go straight into the gospel and I just go straight into talking about salvation and just, you know, Romans 3, Romans 6, and, you know, with, without even stopping, you know, I, I say hello and then I give them 20 minutes. I, I find that the person is not really listening because, first of all, you don't even know whether they're not they're interested in listening to you. Maybe they had an objection that they're thinking about when you're talking to them. Maybe they don't even know yet why you're even explaining to this to them and they're just thinking, why are you talking to me about all this stuff? You haven't given any context to why you're presenting this to them. And I don't want that. I, I want to know that if I'm going to take the time to, to talk to somebody you know, and go through the gospel, I want to know that they're listening and not just thinking, oh, when is this guy going to take a breath so that I can tell him to, to, to leave? So that's the reason why I prefer to ask for permission. I will always say, you know, is it okay if I take a couple of minutes to just explain it to you and show you a couple of Bible verses? Then if they say yes, then I know I have their attention. I have their permission to, to take a bit longer. Now, if they... If they're not interested and they don't give me any, uh, any time, I still will try and leave them with something. I'll just say, hey, well, just in 30 seconds, you know, this is why we're here. Most people think you have to be good enough to go to heaven, but the Bible tells us it's a free gift. It just says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, and that's what the pamphlet explains. So hopefully you have a read and a bit, a think about it. If you have any questions, you can contact us. So I'll always try and leave them with one verse, leave them with a thought, so that... The, the reason why I think it's important that we leave them with that thought is because we want to make sure that they know we weren't there just to get them to go to a church, that that was the reason why. Um, so I feel, especially if you're using the approach, you know, can I invite you to a church and you don't get to say anything, that's the last thing they're going to think. They just think, oh, they're just here inviting me to a church. And I don't want, if I get a brief time to talk to them, to leave them with something, I want them to know the reason why I was there was to explain how they can be sure of heaven. So there's some points there. Now, what are some common objections? So that's how I start the conversation. If you have any questions about that later, you can ask me. Um, now, what are some common objections that people say when you're trying to start that conversation with them? I've just got three examples here. There's, you know, there's a million different objections that people give, and that's why we just need wisdom of how to, to deal with them. But the three main ones that I hear all the time is, you know, why, you know, when you ask them, well, what do you think is the reason that God will let you into heaven? You know, I'm a pretty good person. Now, what do I, how do I swing that comment or that objection into the gospel? This is how I do it. When somebody says, you know what, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. I think I'll be pretty good, good enough to go to heaven. What I say to them is, you know, that's what, that's what most people think. You know, many people think you have to be good enough to go to heaven. Um, but did you know that the Bible teaches that we can't be good enough? Is it okay if I just take a few minutes to explain to you what the Bible says? Now, the reason why I say that and the reasoning that I have behind that is if you say to them, hey, you know, most people believe that, many people believe that, you, you sort of make them feel, feel comfortable saying like, hey, you're not the only one. 
you know, a lot of everyone believes that. That's fine, you know, because everyone has that thought, you know. So I'm not trying to pick on you because you believe that. Hey, everybody does. Everybody we speak to does that, and and that's true. But that's what I would say to sort of swing it around. I would just basically say, you know, I'd address the objection, and I'd just say, you know, that's what most people think. Most people think you have to be good enough to get to heaven. But the truth is, the Bible says we can't be good enough. Is it okay if I take a few minutes to explain to you what the Bible says? What about if somebody says, you know, I go to you know, such and such Orthodox church or such and such Catholic church or such and such Baptist church or whatever. What do I say to that? If they tell me that they go to, a, go to some sort of church or, they, uh, or they, they know about Jesus. Well, my response to that is generally, if somebody says to me, well, I go to such and such Anglican church. What I normally say is, you know, my, first of all, you know, my purpose is not here, is not to try and get you to come to a church. I'm not trying to get you to switch churches, so that's fine. So just ease their mind there. And then this is how I come across. I say, you know, many people that I speak to that go to a church, you know, they're very, they're very familiar with what Jesus did. You know, so I'm not here to tell, you know, they're very familiar that Jesus died, that he was buried, and he rose again, and who he is. But I say, but they're still not 100% sure that if they died, they would go to heaven. You know, what about yourself? So the reason why I come across like that is, you know, I want to make it clear, you know, I'm not trying to get you to switch churches, so I want to clear that out of their mind. And I say many people we speak to that go to a church are very familiar with Jesus because I want them to know, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to teach you something you already know, you know, because you probably already know about Jesus. You know he died and he rose again. So I say, you know, many people we talk to or I speak to, they, they know about Jesus, they're very familiar with who he is, and then this is when I swing it back to the 100% show. But... If they were to die today, they're not 100% sure that they would go to heaven. What about yourself? Do you know for sure or do you have some doubt? And then I'm back in here and then, I, and then I ask them, is it okay if I take a few minutes to explain? And you might get, you know, an injection that's like, I don't believe in X. You know, I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in hell. I don't believe, whatever they are, I don't believe the Bible is God's word. You know, whatever objection that is where they don't believe in something that you're trying to, to, t to tell them, my response is generally the same. I just say, oh, I just say, oh, okay, that you don't believe in that. But has anyone ever explained to you what the Bible says a person has to do to go to heaven? So I just, you know, I just acknowledge that that's an objection. I say, oh, okay, you know, that's, some, you know, that's, that's interesting. But then I just bring it back to, well, has any, anyone ever explained to you? you know, and then I'll just go through the same, you know, well, is it okay if I take a few minutes and just explain it? If nobody's actually ever explained it from the Bible, and just keep it on the gospel, and then I'll address their objection later on after I give them the gospel. Now, maybe I'll just um, bring up, actually. I hope you guys are finding this a bit helpful because we're going to go soul winning. I wanted to do this early on, just so I was hoping it would help you soul winning. Um, let me just pull up. So our gospel tract here. <clears throat> Alright, so let's talk a bit about how to explain the gospel. Now, I wrote this tract in a way that um, I give the gospel. So, you know, if you want to know how, how I give the plan of salvation, you can pretty much just read through this. Uh, you know, if you're not very good at giving the plan of salvation or you don't think you're very confident at it, I mean, this could really help you. You can see the verses that you need to memorize. You can read through it and get familiar with, what, you know, what I'm trying to explain along the way. I'm not just going to, I'm not going to go through everything because I don't want to bore you guys with that. Because I know most of you guys here, you know, are very, very familiar at how to give the gospel. But I just want to note a couple of things along the way that I try to emphasize uh, when I'm giving the gospel. Now, I have, I've split it up into five points. So we have all sinned by breaking God's laws. God must punish sin. Jesus Christ took your punishment for you. What you must do to be saved from hell. And number five, receive the free gift of eternal life. So if anyone thinks, if anyone says, oh, you're one, two, three, repeat after me, just tell them, no, we're one, two, three, four, five, repeat after me. Uh, we have five points. But uh, and obviously we're not, we're not one, two, three, repeat after me either. But uh, we got, we got, I, I split it into five points here. So the first point, we have all sinned by breaking God's laws. When I, when I explain the gospel to people, there's a couple of things that I want them to get at this point. Number one is, you know, obviously that we've all sinned by breaking God's laws. 
But I want to make sure that they understand what the word sin is. And especially when you're talking to somebody that's foreign or, or somebody from China, you know, we, we take for granted that everybody knows what the word sin means, whereas it's not always the case. I mean, obviously, if you're speaking to somebody from a Christian background, you may not need to go into it. But if you're speaking to somebody that English is not their first language, you know, make sure you clarify what the word sin means and, and explain that to them. You know, I don't spend a lot of time on the first point. You know, I believe Way of the Master and Ray Comfort and, and their, uh, uh, their ministry of how they teach people to give the gospel. I don't necessarily have anything against, you know, having the law before grace. You know, obviously, they preach a false gospel. They preach that you have to turn from your sins to be saved. But I think where they err uh, in, in how they uh, have the plan of salvation is they emphasize point number one way too much. And they think the power of salvation is in how sinful a person is. And they go through, are you a liar, you're a thieving, adulterer at heart? And they really are trying to bring this person under conviction. And they think that's where the power of the gospel is. Meaning, if you can just show somebody how vile and how wretched and how sinful they are, then they will call out to the Savior and they'll want salvation. But, you know, we know in Romans 1.6, and uh, let's just uh, see that verse there. Romans 1.16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the power of salvation is not in how sinful you are. The power of salvation is in the gospel of Christ. Gospel means good news. It's, it's the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection that he's died and he's paid for our sins, that you have a free home in heaven to anyone that will believe on him. That's the power of the gospel, and that's the point I want to emphasize to the person. I don't want to go away from their door just them thinking that I'm just some obnoxious person that just wanted to show them how wicked and how vile they were. You know, I want to just, them to just acknowledge, hey, you know, they are a sinner. They have sinned. And it doesn't take too long to actually show that to somebody. Some people do think that they haven't sinned. But I don't spend a lot of time on that. I just want them to acknowledge, hey, you have sinned. And the other thing I want to point out in that verse is if somebody thinks they have to be good enough to get to heaven, I use that first point to show them, well, that's why you can't be good enough to get to heaven, because you've already sinned. And the illustration that I use is generally a doctor that commits murder. So it doesn't matter how many lives you've saved, you could save a thousand lives, that doesn't get you off if you commit murder, just to show that one sin you know, will, will condemn you even if you've done a lot of good. So it's the same that works with God. If you tell all this truth, that doesn't write off the fact that you've lied. And that's, that's the main points that I go through in point number one. You know, point number two, God must punish sin. Now with point number two, for me, I, I don't make it a big point for them to, at this point, believe that hell is real. Because I don't want to get stuck on that, that rabbit or that point of, of trying to convince them that hell is a real place. Because most people that don't believe the Bible, they, 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 don't even, they haven't yet grasped the concept of hell, and they don't even know whether it's real yet. So at this point, you know, I don't want to get them stuck at point number two and not get to point number three, point number four, point number five, which I will get to if they have a problem with hell. But at that point, I just want them to acknowledge that God's punishment in the Bible is hell for sin. So they don't necessarily have to agree with it. They don't have to necessarily believe that it exists. But I'm just trying to show them that there is a punishment for sin and that God's punishment is hell, whether they believe it or not, or whether they agree with it or not. That's what I'm trying to get across to them in point number two. Okay, point number three is where I explain the gospel. So instead of using Romans 5, I started using 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. I thought that was a great verse to turn to, because it actually explains the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. And you explain that in as much detail as you think is necessary for that person. That's what I do at point three. Okay, point number four, what you must do to be saved from hell. So this is what I would say to them. I'd say, you know, works are good, but it's not necessary for salvation. And you're explaining that it's only believed to be saved, that it's not works, not repent of your sins, not join a church, not keep the commandments. But the main thing that I emphasize here when I get to this point 
is the difference between knowing what Jesus did and believing on what Jesus did. And the way I explain it to them, I feel it really helps them to understand. Because when you first approach them and you ask them the question, do you know for sure you died today that you, that you would go to heaven? Most people are not sure. And most people are not sure because they're thinking they've done good, they're thinking they've done bad, they don't know how they measure up before God. That's 99% of the time what most people will think. So it's safe to assume that with most people. But you can ask them, you know, is that, is that what you think? So when I get to this point four and I say to them, you know, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Sometimes what I'll say to people is, you know, when you read that verse, you're probably thinking, well, I already believe in Jesus. Especially if you're talking to somebody from a Christian background. They read that verse and they say, you know, I already believe in Jesus. But what they're saying, even though they say, I already believe in Jesus, what they're really saying is, I already know what Jesus has done. I already know who Jesus is. So what I want to do at that point, and what I found really effective is, is to point out that difference and, and I, what I will say to them, I'll say, you know what, when I first asked you, do you know for sure you died today, you'd go to heaven? You weren't sure. And it might be because you think you had to be good enough to go to heaven. Is that right? And I'll say, oh yeah, I was thinking, you know, am I good enough to go to heaven? And I say to them, you know, see, but you know what Jesus did. You know, I, I didn't teach you anything new here today. You know, you know about Jesus. You know what he did when he died on the cross. But then I relate it back to that doubt that they had. And I say to them, but the reason why you weren't sure is that even though you knew what Jesus did, you were trusting yourself to get you to heaven, weren't you? You were trusting your own goodness to take you to heaven. So do you see how that's not the belief that the Bible is talking about when it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that you need to put all your faith in what Jesus has done for you to take you to heaven. So I find that that has been very effective when explaining the gospel to people, what it means to believe on people, especially those that are believing in work salvation, because it just brings it to the front of their mind saying, you said you believed, but you see how you weren't actually trusting? You were trusting your works. And what the Bible is saying when it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is you have to trust Jesus Christ to show them that difference. And I find that that has been very effective um, in getting people to understand what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number five, you know, receive the free gift of eternal life. Um, this is the point where we would explain eternal security, explain that if they believe on Jesus Christ, that they would be saved forever. And that's a really good way of getting people to understand that it's only believe on Jesus Christ. And if they believe, they're saved forever. And that's how they can have assurance of salvation. And I usually give an example there. I, would, I, I give an example once I've explained everything to believe on Jesus, that you're saved forever. You know, you give the illustration of somebody that believes on Jesus and maybe doesn't go to church and maybe does something terrible like commit murder. Uh, and I think it's good to give that example so that it tests their understanding, to test whether or not they uh, understand eternal security, they, they understand that Jesus has paid it all. Now, if somebody has a problem understanding that concept, there's really two points that I sort of bring across to them. Number one is because the Bible says you have everlasting life, that the gift of God is eternal life, you know, I say to the number one, can God lie? If God says it's eternal life and it lasts forever, if it wasn't going to last forever, then God would be a liar. And number two, the point I try and explain to them to get them to understand that is, you know, well, when Jesus died on the cross, did he die for all sins? I asked them, did he die for all sins or did he just, just die for some sins? And everyone, most people will say, well, he died for all sins. He died for the sins of the world. And then I'll ask them, well, when Jesus died on the cross for all sins, did he die? He didn't just die for the sins in the past. He also died for sins in the future, didn't he? And they say, well, yeah. Well, cause, so I ask them, because when he died on the cross, all our sins were in the future. He died 2,000 years ago. So all our sins were in the future. That's why we can have everlasting life, because when Jesus died on the cross, he's paid for all the sins in the future as well. All the sins that you don't even know you're going to commit. So even though... A sin you may commit in the future may surprise you. It doesn't surprise God because when he died on the cross, he knew every sin you were going to commit and every sin you have committed, you will commit in the future as well. So they're the, they're the main points that I say when I go through the plan of salvation. Hopefully there's a few tips there to help you. A couple of other tips, obviously, to, is to memorize the plan of salvation. If you can memorize the verses that you turn to, That'll just make you a lot more confident, a lot more comfortable when giving um, the plan of salvation. And, you know, this tract could help you. So if you just read through the tracts and memorize the verses in there, that could help you. A couple of other practical tips out soul winning. 
Now, when you're giving the gospel to somebody or you're talking to somebody, if there, you know how sometimes there are distractions that come along? Maybe it's a dog. Maybe it's telefo- the telephone. Maybe it's uh, uh, their loved one calling them to come to dinner or come to lunch. Maybe it's like a, a brother or a sister that's walking past the front door and they're like, what are they doing, right? Now, my advice to you when those distractions occur is to always acknowledge the distraction. Don't just ignore the distraction. So let's say somebody is like, uh, you know, supposedly listening to me give the gospel and they, you know, it looks like they're looking at their phone and they need to send a text. I won't just keep going. I'll say, hey, you know, hey, fin- you know, if you need to finish the text, you just finish it and then, and then when you're finished, let me know and then we'll continue. And then they'll normally say, oh, no, no, and then they'll put their phone away. Or if somebody comes and they're, you know, they're walking by the front door and they're listening and they're seeing what's going on, I don't just ignore them. I'll say like, oh, hey, how are you doing? You know, I'm just explaining a couple of things to them. You're welcome to listen. But my point there is, 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 I find that if you acknowledge the distraction, if there's a distraction that comes into the conversation and you acknowledge it, then it gets their mind off it. You know, maybe the phone is ringing. You say, hey, you need to get the phone. You know, you can, you can answer the phone and we can continue afterwards. I find that, that really helps. Otherwise, you know, they're distracted. They're not really listening to you and you're continuing to explain something. And because of that distraction, they're not talking to you. So whether it's the phone, relatives, babies and kids, you know, if something is really getting in the way, you know, point it out and say, you know, is, is, uh, is there something we can do to make it uh, easier for you to, to, to listen? Um, another point, another uh, a good soul winning tip I think is good. Now remember that when, you, when you're going soul winning and you're talking to people, now this is a conversation that you're having. You know, it's not a, it's not a presentation that you have to go through. So even when you think of this plan of salvation, don't think that you have to hit every single one of these points in this order, right? Because if, if somebody is uh, you know, going to an Anglican church or going to a Baptist church and they're not sure of their salvation, you may not need to spend much time on the first couple of points. So feel free to jump to where it's different and go back and clarify things. You know, that, like we were talking about at the beginning, you know, we don't have to have this one cookie cutter method just for everybody because we're talking to an individual. And we're not trying to get them to just sit through this sales presentation like, okay, you sit down and I'm just going to talk to you and, 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 and do this sales pitch because I want to customize it to that person. So, you know, get to the point. If there's an issue that they have, hey, let's address that issue. You know, if there's, there's a question they have, let's address that question. You know, you don't want to get carried away on rabbit trails. If they have a question, sometimes addressing it might be, hey, that's a good question, but um, let me just explain this to you first. But just remember, it's a conversation. You're talking to an individual that you want to interact with. It's not a sales presentation that they just have to go through. And the reason why I say that, because sometimes with people that are new to soul winning, somebody has an objection or somebody already understands something, but they just feel that they need to go through these points because they think, you know, because I'm soul winning and I need to go through my plan of salvation. You know, don't have this frame of mind. You don't have to have to go through this plan of salvation. This plan of salvation is there as a guide to help you know what are the important points to explain, but it's not the order that you have to explain it. So just do whatever's comfortable, do what is tailored for them, and speak to the person as an individual, not just as an audience. Um, so, you know, relate their responses. Like if somebody has an objection at the beginning where they say, well, they believe in a Catholic church, or they believe in Mary, or they're, they're Muslim, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that into what I'm talking to them about and relate that back. Like if somebody believes they have to work their way to heaven, When I get to the point where I'm saying, you know, it's only believe on Jesus Christ, I'll relate it back to them and say, hey, remember when you said to me what you thought you had to do to go to salvation, uh, do to be saved, I'm going to relate it back to to, to what they were saying to me. You know, it's a conversation, so find out, you know, find out what they believe. Ask them questions and say, you know, do you agree with this? Or, you know, know, get them to interact to make sure that they're uh, understanding you. And another great tip would be, you know, to use hypotheticals. You know, ask open-ended questions. So we use the hypothetical of the guy that believes on Jesus Christ but does such and such sin. Is he still going to heaven? Um, you know, asking open-ended questions. Don't just ask questions that can be a yes or a no answer because you might just get somebody that says yes, 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 and you think they're understanding, but they're not. They're just being polite or they're just trying to get you to go through what you want to explain. So ask them open-ended questions. For example, you know, Instead of saying, do you understand what Jesus did for you when, uh, did for you by dying on the cross? Saying, do you understand that? And they say, yes. Maybe ask the question, so, so what did Jesus do for you? So that you could have a place in heaven. 
So what do you need to do in order to be saved? And get them to reiterate 